Um, if you read the description, I happen to be, to be I happen to be a documented. If you've never been an undocumented person, congratulations, you just met one. Um, we get to get a picture later and be like, oh my god, it's a an undocumented person. Um, and so I doing this type of work right now simply because we're popping for me. If you have not been in the news, undocumented is trendy, is in, try it. Um, <laughs> um, I've been going around the country kind of doing this work, talk, really to, um, telling my narrative and my story um, in a different way. So um, tonight I'm going to share a couple of pieces based on the work that I'm developing. I'm currently working on a play. Um, today I just found out I got a grant, so hey! <laughs> Peacock, a leopard, a panther, 
She wraps the ovejas and stacks them one on top of another, creating a makeshift cushion between our hot bodies and the hard floor. Mama Doña doesn't like to say they were poor. She says she, she says it's an offense to God. She has this model, as long as we have good health and hands to work, we should always praise. She's always talking about God, even though she doesn't even go to church. <laughs> she keeps a giant print Bible next to our door. The letters are like many Oscar de la Olla punching Bible verses in your face every time you open it. She saw a segment on Despierta America which said a Bible next to the door is a great way to ward off bad energies coming into the house. But honestly, in this house, we really should be more concerned over these goddamn roaches and not our chismosa neighbors coming in here. Don't get me wrong, it's not that I'm ungrateful to blame her for us living in this shitty living room, it's just that life fucking sucks. It's my 16th birthday, and while all the kids at my school are learning how to drive and brag about how their parents are buying them the first car, I can't help but think why God is testing me. Stephanie's mom just bought her a new car for her sweet 16. Every morning she drives past me down Story Road, honking and waving as I'm sweating bullets running to school. You would think she would stop, but no, that would be too much for her. She says, I would always stop, but honestly, I gotta go to Starbucks first, and you know the lines are always so long. Plus, I don't have to be late to class. Besides, you can use the exercise. <laughs> Stephanie is the type of citizen I pray to God against her citizenship revolt. <laughs> When she tells me, oh, my parents want to go to Mexico for winter break. You're so lucky your parents can't go anywhere. I pray, please, no see, please, no see, don't make someone steal her social. <laughs> I mean, it's one thing to be poor, which I feel like I got, I got a hand on. I mean, I don't look broke and stuff, but it's a dumber thing to be poor, gay, and undocumented. If oppression was an Olympic sport, I think I would come in first place. It's like God, Jesus, and most other people look up in heaven, like heaven is so boring. Let me start some drama. And they Googled me and found me as an experiment. Yes, if you can't tell, I'm gay. But not the type of gay you can hide. I mean, look at me. I'm like a gay oil spill. I just open my mouth and it's like my vocal cords scream, gay. <laughs> How am I supposed to contain all of this? Don't get it twisted though. I'm not like the gay people on TV. I mean, I'm not white and shit. And I surely don't listen to gay ass music. In school, they started this campaign against using the word gay to describe things that we disapprove of. So I know it's wrong to call things gay when referring to something terrible or whack. You know when dudes say, yo, bro, that shit is gay. But to be honest, some shit is just gay. <laughs> and my gay shit, I mean, those coming out stories on Oprah. It's always some white family coming together talking about how they're going to support their child with this new discovery. The parents shed tears because their son's life is about to be really hard. Then the comments <laughs> sits on the kid, and then the kid goes, hella gay. <laughs> like the type of gay that will call the cops. <laughs> Why can't Oprah or even Christina invite someone that looks like me on their show? I will talk about how all these cholitos call me Guanga because I'm brown and fem. I mean, these schools are our schools. <laughs> Offending me by referring to me as one of the greatest living icons in Mexico. Like, come on. I would actually feel more comfortable if you just straight up call me a maricón. But for real, Cristina really needs to have me on the show. I can just imagine that the novena that's going to happen when I come out to my abuelos. My abuela's going to dust off, dust off her giant print Bible and look for the words everybody use, uses against the gays. Abuelo is going to threaten to send me back to Mexico so I can learn how to be a man, as if in Mexico, two aren't sucking dick. <laughs> like, come on, bro, I came from there. <laughs> but after realizing I'm actually an asset to this house because I translate all the documents, the phone calls, the doctor visits, they will accept me with open, an open embrace and thank God I'm a gay, fluent in English. <laughs> Undocumented? That means I don't have papers, meaning because I was not born in this country, I don't have a social security number, even though I don't know shit about Mexico. I mean, I was three years old when I crossed. Sometimes I imagine my life in Mexico. I picture a fat, dark skinned kid wearing guaraches playing kick the can in a poverty stricken neighborhood, but not like hood poor, I mean like Mexican poor poor. They're like different kinds of poverty, you know? And just as I'm about to teleport to a time I've never known, everything is interrupted by the Moesha storylines I grew up watching. Thanks, Mo. <laughs> all, about, all I know about where I come from, Guerrero, Mexico, is from these old VHS tapes with Leo Renaissance to my abuela, 
We sent him a camcorder we bought on layaway at Circuit City years ago, and he uses it to set us updates on everyone in our town is doing. He films dirt roads, random houses, and all these people they say they miss us send us their greeting. They call us gringos, but if only they knew that we're not living like gringos out here. Mama Noya treasured these videos like they're actually worth money. She wraps them inside plastic bags to keep the roaches from getting to them, and only takes them out when we have visitors. When company arrives, she commands, Gordo, prend el VCR. <laughs> the VCR is old and dusty. Never mind that we now have DVDs that work better and faster. I guess when you're old, you gotta keep it analog. <laughs> when the video plays, she puts out houses, to the house she built with the money she saved here. She tells us that this is going to be our house when we go back. Our house stands off from the rest of the houses on the block. In our town, they say you can tell who live poor, the relatives that live in the U.S. by the houses they built. Compared to some of these houses, we are rich in Mexico. People in Mexico think that we're living like the white people in magazines. These fools are out here thinking our houses look like the pages of better homes and gardens. And who is to blame them? Every time one of our relatives buys one of those Antonio Aguilar calling cards to phone Mexico, they write about their jobs and how well they're doing. Hijo de compa, pues. Yo en la chamba trabajando duro. Fíjate que me compré una troca y es de marca Toyota. Está bien chida, parece un integrante de los tigres del norte. Mexicans are mad liars. We should be honest and tell the Mexicans on the other side not to come here because it sucks to live here. Think about it. You live in your country not knowing one lick of English. You arrive here with no money. Plus, you have to remember the fact that nobody wants you here. Living here is like arriving to a party that nobody invited you to, but the party sucked before you got here. But since no one knows who to blame, why it sucks, they place the blame on you. It's not like you just hop over and have someone greet you with a brochure. Welcome to the great United States of America. Here's a brochure of all our fun attractions. Please don't forget to visit Eastside San Jose, also known as Little Mexico. And on your way out, grab a complimentary churro. And remember, please keep your arms and legs inside the rights of all inside the rights of all times. The United States is not responsible for any loss or stolen wages. <laughs> Finding a job in this country is hard enough. The day laborers that live with us wake up before the sun and walk to the home depot down the street. On my way to school, I wave at them. At a distance, you just see a herd of brown men playing dice or staying vigilant as possible for the employers looking for work. It's kind of sad to see these grown men begging people for work. Medio tells me the brown employers are always the worst. It's like they forgot when they, how they got here. I would have said that I'm, since I'm turning 16, then maybe it's time for her to take me down to La Tropicana to get me a green card. La Tropicana is a shopping center on a story in King. They built a Mi Pueblo supermarket, so naturally this become a hub for all the Mexicans in San Jose. It's somewhat funny that most kids born here have parents that take them to get driver's permits at the DMV when they turn 16, but mine are trying to take me to La Tropicana to commit a federal crime. <laughs> I went up and said she found a job for me. At 16, the only job I want during summer break is <laughs> raging water to great America. I'm trying to be that big selling corn dogs and tater tots and printing the buttons so the roller coasters can start. I can, I can picture my face in one of those employees of the month walls. Those are the kind of jobs Americans kids should have. But no, of course, that would be too much to ask. I went up and said she found me a job working at the electronic factory where my Tia Elo works. She says it'll check papers so no one will even notice that I'm 16 and not 18 like it says in this fake ID. I look at my fake ID. In my picture, I look hell of ice up. <laughs> we took the picture of Fotografia Medina and the senor taking the picture told me not to smile. My mustache is growing out and I went out to my hair so I look older. Whoever made my ID, they didn't even bother to use an exacto line to run around the picture. This shit looks like they, whoever made it used baby scissors and Elmer's glue to put it together. According to my abuela, this according to my abuela, this factory gets away with hiring undocumented workers because they're a staffing agency run by Chinos. I tell my abuela that the folks are actually Vietnamese because we're in San Jose, not Chinos. But you know Mexicans are super racist. Come on, racist ass grandma. <laughs> The stopping agency is top rated among all the immigrants in the neighborhood because they hire a lot of undocumented folks. In essence, corporations employ these assassin agencies for them to be not be liable for the workers, meaning if any of us get hurt on the job, then technically it's our fault. 
It's five in the morning. Our shift at the factory starts at six. And since my tia Edo doesn't drive, we have to wait for La Baitera. La Baitera is an everyday name used for La Señora, who is the only one with a license. Her role is to give us rides from the factory to Fremont. She charges $50 a week per person, and being that she managed to squeeze all of us on her Honda Civic, well, that homework is making hella bang. <laughs> We get to work, it's a huge factory, and the workers are more <laughs> señoras than one or two dudes. No one speaks Spanish here, even though the line leader commences in broken, nobody speaks English here, even though the line leader commences in broken English. In my head, I correct her English, because I'm a bitch like that. <laughs> <laughs> our job is anything but fun. We stand on our feet for eight hours, sometimes 12, and then we were forced to work overtime. It's an assembly line, so we stand right in front of one another, but we aren't allowed to talk because less true gum. We're like human robots assembling computer products, unable to, unable to have any social interaction. I stare at my tia. In my head, I think, they should build robots for this. This fucking job is so mindless. <laughs> tia Edo is the fastest one in the line. She's proud to show it off. It's almost like a game. And slowly, one after another, each senora joins the game. I am annoyed and dreaming of my life as a corndog salesperson. <laughs> They smile and they race to see if we can package most of the product. We can't make noise, so the señoras hold their laughter in their belly, their smile cheek to cheek, their cachetes blown up like balloons trying to hold back the laughter. Before we know it, our 12 hour shift has ended. We pile back on the Honda Civic. I'm the smallest one of all. Uh, we pile back in the Honda Civic. I'm the smallest one from all the señoras, so I lay across their laps. <laughs> There, there was always mad traffic on our way from Fremont to San Jose. I'm dozing off, but the radio's on blast. My cella is playing, and all the señoras begin to lean, sing from the top of their lungs. Sola por mi soledad. Tío Elo even looks back at me mid song. Her eyes are heavy. She smiles and says, Mañana vamos a chingarle otra vez. I roll, close, I roll my eyes. I roll over, closing my eyes, saying, Please, God, I hope I get fired tomorrow. <laughs> Um, so this is kind of like I said what I'm doing, um, what I'm trying to do I, I, in the piece that I'm trying to do is definitely, I feel like sometimes there's like this idea of undocumented people live and I don't think, I think people have like this huge understanding of the nuances and how, how mess it is. Like imagine your grandma who is hella old and you're 16 taking you to the shopping center and be like, you're going to get a great party today. Um, I'm like, oh my god, this is and this is the things you have to do to survive. So we are like, oh my god, that's a crime. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, we have to pick ideas anyway. Um, so I'm trying to like figure out a way to kind of like create uh, a, a storyline in which the lives of undocumented people kind of roll out like a sitcom. And I feel like for me, in the voice of a 16 year old, I've always been, I don't think I'm high maintenance, but I like things a certain way. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so when I was 16, I used to like, I feel like I used to terrorize my grandma because I was like, oh my god, why are you doing things like that? Like, that's so Mexican. Um, because I, was, I grew up here since I was three, so I'm used to doing things a different way. And even now, I go back and I try to tell her, like, girl, like, <laughs> so I think it, it's like the juxtaposition of being an American kid and still being raised in these old, like, super <laughs> understandings of, of, of Mexicanness, and I'm like, it doesn't work here, girl, like, that's why we left Mexico. <laughs> um, I feel like I'm that kid in that thing, and like, but yeah, I don't have to do So, um, I grew up in East San Jose, I migrated here when I was three years old, um, and I always had, I always had like, a, 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 an American upbringing. I, it's the early 90s, you know, where the girls were watching Dawson's Creek, I was watching uh, Moesha, Living Color, right? So I think for me, one of the interesting things about um, growing up in the 90s in the United States is that um, what, what was American culture back then was very much black culture, right? We had R&B was popping, Jodeci, Monica, Brandy, you know, you were the team Brandy, team Monica, team Monica every day. Um, and so I kind of grew up in this kind of neighborhood well, that was, uh, it was the hood. It was like uh, gang members and all of that, but we were, we, this is the fun. But the five of us, my grandma brought, of us, brought us, and my two older cousins were the ones that were older. So they were the ones that kind of introduced American culture into the household, because back in the day, we have to like, um, you had, uh, if you wanted to make a mixtape, you had to record it on the cassette tape. So that was homegirl. And back in the day, we had lyrics.com, so you had to write down the lyrics on the notebook. Um, 
So I'm sure we have a lot of notebooks and like cousins trying to write down all these songs. And that's how kind of we learned English based through under, um, having this understanding. Um, and so one of the things that my, this is my grandma and my grandpa, um, and one of the beautiful things that I grew up in this neighborhood is the fact that uh, for, for undocumented people, oftentimes finding jobs is like the hardest thing, right? It oftentimes, it's, uh, undocumented folks have to create their own sources of income, right? So most of them are <laughs> small businesses. That's why you'll see people, if you go on go online and Twitter challenge, people are selling everything from casaditas to bananas. Um, because you have, to, you have to be innovative in creating your own economies because nobody hires you. My grandparents were a lot older when they came to the country, and since they were a lot older, they, nobody would hire them. It's not like you're going to see them at a register at McDonald's or anything that you have to have any social interaction because you also need the language. And being that they're monolingual Spanish speakers, they have to create their own thing. And one of the things that they started doing was recycling bottles and cans to make a living. So they're the people that would go to the trash cans collecting bottles and cans and take them to the recycling bin, right? I always told my grandma that she was like, made, um, make the green roof make cooler before our green um, and that's the reality of the documented people, that we have to do all these things to kind of survive. So they basically raised me and we took the bottles in hand. Um, and really, and for me, as someone that, that uh, began writing, me absorbing, uh, observing these things was kind of what influenced my work. My grandma was also the cook to all the day laborers that were the Home Depot. There was like a Home Depot across the street from my house. And my house was always packed with people from seven to nine. I used to hate my house. Like, oh, these men are gonna come here. It's gonna be so packed. But the novela's gonna be on blast. Like, I'm trying to be like these immigrants. They can't. <laughs> and so I think this became this process of like being surrounded by all this kind of um, history of people where they come from. And most of the people that migrated to our neighborhood were specifically from the southern states, so Puebla, Oaxaca, Guerrero, um, the three indigenous states in Mexico, so it really has context in the way that, in, in which we kind of created a community with each other. Um, and so one of the things I point out in the early 90s, I think right now, what we're facing in the conversation around immigration, because you know, Donald Trump won, and everyone's like, oh my god, the immigrants, they have so bad, we gotta save them. Uh, let's adopt one. Um, <laughs> and I think for me, in context of growing up in California, in 1994, Prop 187 was one thing that was prevalent. It was a conversation. Governor Pete Wilson at the time introduced this proposition, which actually kind of criminalized and documented folks, right? It, 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 it said that we, didn't, we shouldn't have access to public schools or public hospitals. And this was the legislation, the same jargon, you go back and listen to the same jargon that people said Wilson was using regarding the documented folks. And you know the same image where everybody's hopping over? Like that's one that they played over and over and over. Kind of like the same rhetoric that we're now see, seeing now. Um, but I think like right now it's interesting because you know, Richard shows that most Mexicans are not coming, like this club is not popping no more. That's um, <laughs> more 21, you know, girl, you know, they close me these down. Um, and in 1994, this is what I look like. Um, and one of the interesting, like you can see my grandma and mom, they don't want to forget I was Mexican. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or she knows they get some fashions. Um, <laughs> um, and in 1994, this is what I look like. And one of the interesting things that happened in 1994 and the kids that grew up at that time is that people forget. I think one of the interesting things right now that we're having a conversation around dreamers and all of that, you know, uh, you'll see a lot of right now that everyone's campaigning. People are going to be like, these children came by no part of their own, right? I'm like, bro, I'm 31. Like, <laughs> that's how long we've been waiting for this Dream Act thing to pass, child. Like, you know, that's why I joke around that the Dream Act is like that abusive boyfriend you have. Like, you're hoping he's going to change. Like, he's coming. He's going to change. Like, girl, we need to start getting new bills. You know? <laughs> College who are Americanized, who speak English. I was an English major with an emphasis in creative writing. I failed. The only class I failed in college was early British Lit because who needs that? Um, <laughs> and so I think people forget that. And so sometimes when I tell people I'm undocumented, it's like, oh my god, you have a heart. I'm like, yeah, bro, but don't sigh because I'm not going to give you scholarships. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I have something called DACA, Different Action for Childhood Arrival, and executive orders, kind of a moment. Every 
two years, I paid the government four hundred ninety-five dollars, and they gave me this work permit so I could work and pay taxes. It's not, it's not anything, right? See, it's the same. Now, down. Every time I try to complain, dog, I try to get it shorter and shorter and shorter. Like an elevator pitch. Um, <laughs> But I took this picture because I was so excited. When DACA got announced, I was like, oh my god. Everybody texted me, congratulations, you're going to be able to work. Aren't you so happy? I'm like, bitch, what do you think I've been doing? <laughs> 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 it worked, it's a My big ass social <laughs> But I got excited because it was so monumental. But then I had to wait. I waited like a year for it to pass because, you know, as a people of color, even the government gives you something, you got to be like, So I'm like, I'm waiting for like the first people to apply and see if they got deported. And they <laughs> <laughs> so I waited. And then I was like, okay, it's not a scam. You know, it's not a scam. Um, and then I went to apply. And then even as I was going, the person driving me, I'm like, can you take me to the immigration service? They're like, it's just a time. I'm like, no, I need to work my permit. I'm not trying to go home yet. <laughs> I'm like, wait for me outside just in case I don't come out. Um, <laughs> But then I was smart. I was like, you know what? Let me take a picture in front of this. So if I go missing, you know, <laughs> don't you guys watch, watch the first 48? The first 48 hours is the first, the most crucial in such a crime. So if this is the last image you saw me, where do you think I'm gonna be? <laughs> Wi-Fi because Google's over there, but no, we still be sailing at the Starbucks. Um, <laughs> and so that was my first job, and I used to hate that job because they wouldn't treat us well. They were so mean, and then I'm like, girl, I speak better English than the boss. Um, like, girl, the only difference between you and me is that you got social networks. Um, and so um, after I got that job, I left that job. My first job was working at a library, and it was cute. I'm like, oh my god, this is what it feels like to be a citizen. Like. You get breaks. <laughs> you go to the bathroom. You can use your phone. I'm like, oh my god, if this is citizenship, I don't want to leave. Um, on top of that, talk about the dental and your healthcare, I'm here for it. Um, but um, eventually, I ended up um, leaving that, and now I work as a full time artist, which is crazy. I'm a little, no, I'm not, I'm not I'm here working at the line no more. But who knows what happens? Something good happens, 
You're gonna, if something tragic to happen. Like, look how Selena ended, right? She was like, 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 we gotta think like this this way. It's a survival. Um, and so, like, and then as I said that, Trump got elected. <laughs> I'm like, and I was like, you know what, that life, I'm still going, because I need to figure out if I want to stay in this country or not. Like, is it really popping over there? Um, and I went and I loved it. I love when people say it's late, if you have papers to change, what the United States is, and my perspective and my place in the United States as an undocumented person, right? And even now, I think my, my abuelito, um, it's actually, it was his birthday yesterday. Um, and one of the things that I realized was that, that oftentimes, as undocumented people in this country, it is very important for us to ask the question of what are we holding on to here, right? And there's this idea that we come from these places that don't have history, or, they, or they're just so poverty stricken, that we create this kind of barrier as undocumented people um, to return back to. But I went to Mexico City, I was like, I was so mad. I was like, bro, like this is lit. We got mad libraries, we got hella museums, like we got pyramids next to the Walmart. We're like, we ancient, you know? What we got here, you know? Yosemite or whatever. <laughs> An archaeological place, you know? So I was just thinking about it that way. But I, um, this, big, this piece that I wrote, wrote that I'm going to be. Um, it's more about returning back through DACA to kind of see my grandfather. Um, and more, and more, one of the questions that I'm asking more of myself is like, what if some things are sacred, right? And some things we lose with the idea of being here. So for me, it's really questioning that. What are the things that I find more sacred um, than this place and the this connection that we have? So this is how I'll, 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 I'll read this. It goes like this. When my grandfather carried me on his back into the United States, he made sure to always remind me of the place we left behind. He spoke poetically of our municipal. He told me histories of heroes like Lucio Cabañas and the beautiful terrain in Guerrero. The last time I saw my grandfather was in Mexico. After 25 years since I arrived in this country, I was given permission to return on advanced parole. I submitted counter paperwork so I could return finally know the place so many people tell me to go back to. I arrived in Acapulco and took a bus from Acapulco to Dwight at Duyac de Alvarez Guerrero. The drive to Duyac is about two hours. I stay vigilant on my surroundings because I'm far away from home. The bosses cross municipal as a municipal and I watch men and women that look like my that they look like my family board and I'm bored. I wonder if they can tell I'm not from here. From the, out the window I see kids pop belly and dark just like me in a picture my mother keeps from her before we cross. We finally arrive at La Toyac. The bus station is crowded with people, and I make sure to stay close to my belongings. Before I left Acapulco, I called my tia, and she said she would pick me up from the station. I look out for her in different directions, but all the women look alike. I remember my idea looks like because I was three when I left. Bordo! I hear my, my tia, a woman shouting. I turn around, and there in a turquoise shirt, a box of women introduces herself as to my tia Chela. I hug her like I know her. We drive out to her house where my grandfather has been waiting for me anxiously. It has been three years since my grandfather self-deported here. While in the United States, he made, sure our living, he made our living unbearable with his drinking. He complained every time he drank. I ignored him. It made up my mind that it was just another poor excuse of him not wanting to be responsible. As I walk into the house, there at the kitchen table sat my old man. I run to hug him, trying to engulf his body into mine. He looked more tired now, his body strong, the bags under his eyes are heavier, my old man always with a toothpick, toothpick in his mouth. Siéntate, Nico, vamos a platicar. I take a seat, my tía goes into the kitchen to heat up food. To heat up food. I take out my, I, oh, she serves us food. I will not make me report on everyone is doing in the United States. I take out my iPhone and show him pictures of all of my grandmother and my tía and all the festivities she, that she, he has missed since he left. He smiles, and I can tell he, wish he, he wishes he could come back to us. The heat in Atoyac is no different from Acapulco. It is dry, and the mosquitoes don't make, them the situation, don't make the situation better at all. After our widow falls asleep in a hammock, I sit in the patio looking out into our town. The moon is, hot, the moon is high, and the stars are brightly lit, and the, soon, and the sound of grasshoppers takes over the street. I can't believe I'm here, the place I was born, the place I hear so many stories about. For so long, this place was a myth to me, and now I can feel this heat against my skin. I then think, what if they don't let me back to the United States? Why do I have to stay here? 
Fear rushes into my body. I turn to my abuelo, his old body swinging back and forth on the hammock. In the United States, he used to make it, he used to sleep on the living room couch, and all his time there, he sees time he spent there. He never he never knew what a felt felt like. I watch him sound asleep, and I feel guilty for allowing fear to consume me. I walk over to where my abuelo swings. The night is hot, so I lay on a bed sheet and lay on the floor next to him. I fall asleep as I pray, please God, don't let me get stuck here. There's a little torn down house, about eight years old, 80 years old, that sits in the corner of the city where I was born. A house my grandmother asked me to take pictures of before coming here. A house that at first glance I thought, this should not be the place my grandmother speaks poetry about. I want to write about her eyes, how her eyes gleam when she saw this dilapidated house. As she said, that's your home, mijo, that's where you come from. I want to write, but I'm lost. I look ahead and I don't know what the road leads. I look behind and I don't know if I should return. What happens to the spirit when it gets lost on its journey? How do you make it home when the physicalities of loss and poverty are at bay? How do I recreate a poetic poem like my grandmother to keep staying? How do I keep telling myself over and over that I come from a beautiful place and that one day I will return? My grandfather passed away on a Monday. I received the call at 6 a.m. from my cousin. On the phone she said, Yoshi, have you heard? Papatino passed away. My body froze, and there on my bed I felt like I was thrown into an empty universe as if my body was suspended in darkness. I didn't scream or any, make any sobbing sounds. Tears rolled down my eyes and my feet. I called out for him, Abuelito, 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 like the numerous times I did when I was a kid afraid of something. I wanted him to respond, Que tienes, people? I quickly opened up my laptop and searched for flights to Guerrero. I can't go, snapped me into reality and I found myself staring into the walls of my bedroom. I can't go, I can't go, I can't go. My old man lay dead on a hospital bed and I am miles away in what seems to be another world. I pictured him, his old body on white sheets looking like a dump of dirt. That old man loved me so much, he put up with all the abuse this country throws on us. He loved me so much that he used to collect glass bottles from people's trash cans just so I could become a writer. He returned to Mexico without anything to show for his journey here. In a way, I was a manifestation of his American dream. The following day, my prima in Mexico called me via FaceTime as they were preparing for his burial. The people from across town came to say their goodbyes. I watched as people I've never known cried for my old men. Some claimed to remember me when I was a baby. It is el hijo de Tina. Si, me acuerdo de ti. Put the next phone next to him, I asked my cousin. There was his, there he was in a white button-up shirt, his bald head asleep. Abuelito, I'm sorry. I whispered into the phone. From my phone, as I sat in my bed in Los Angeles, I watched the procession. Several men lift his casket as a group of musicians play on one of his favorite songs, Historia del Amor by Los Panchos. As they played this song, along, the song, I sang along. I used to get mad at him growing up because he would play this music all on a full volume while I tried to read. I guess he played this song so, music so often that I had no choice but to memorize the lyrics. They arrived to the cemetery, an old relative sent some parting words, and then I watched as they lowered him into a ditch. They throw dirt on top of him. Over the phone, I hear the sound of the dirt's pebbles crashing into the casket. I can't bear to watch, so I can't, so I hang up. I never vocalized my prayers to my grandfather. In my head, I made an excuse I did this to protect him. He, was, he had enough in the world to worry about, and I didn't want him to battle with the inner turmoil of having a poor grandson. I tend to do it with my family, keep secrets for them to protect them, from but deep down inside, I know I did this to protect myself. I don't want to feel like a disappointment. After all, I'm a product of their sacrifice. My whole purpose for coming to this country was to make them proud. I'm a Mexican man, expected to live up to, to, to my masculinity. My grandfather never brought it up, but the thing about queerness is that you know when it's around you. My queerness is in every fiber of my being, rest in my hair, in my vocal cords, in my mannerisms. There is no way of suppressing it because inevitably it will manifest. They, kids, they say kids and drunks always tell the truth, and if this proves to be true, then my grandfather was one of the most honest men. We're sitting in the living room. I'm mad because, I, because this is the third time this week my grandfather is drunk. The last time he drank like this, he ended up hospitalized, and we had to watch over him day in and day out. I'm scolding him, asking him, don't you see that you, when you drink like this, you make everyone's life miserable? I've never spoken to him like this. 
My grandfather, after all, is a Mexican, and there's a certain level of respect you maintain for elders, but especially if those elders are men. My grandfather gets mad, and a voice that thund like thunder shouts, you should be grateful me and your grandmother took you in because you're a bachelor child. It is then that I before again, standing outside of my house, the first, the first house we moved into when we arrived in the U.S. My mother stands on one end in the yard and my grandmother on the other. She asked me, choose who you want to live with. I choose my grandmother because since I was young, I knew my mother to be fractured by her own demons to look after me. And for again, wondering why my father never bothered to claim me, why my grandfather's voice, inter my grandmother's vo voice interrupts, my grandfather's voice interrupts. Tu nunca vas a ser hombre. It's funny to me. Because when I become upset, I turn into my mother. Her hands shake, her eyes fill up with tears. She is too thick, but she's too dignified to tell you where she's hurting. So instead of admitting that she is wounded, she lets the words out that cut deeper. Well, if being a man means being a drunk like you, then I pray I never turn into you. My grandfather sits quietly next to me. My grandmother sits quietly next to me. She knows why I'm hurt. She places her hand on my shaking lap and tells me, I will love you no matter who tells you that you are wrong. So that's the thing. So one of the things that after my grandfather, I think one of the conversations that I'm having right now is with, uh, with the thing we're going up with elders is that you don't have time. Time is passing by. Um, and the beautiful thing about my grandfather is that at least he, I think he sensed that he wasn't going to last long, right? Because he died right two years after he, three years right after he, he went back home. Uh, and I think one of the things that him was like, I don't want to die in this country because it's not my land. I don't want to die here. And I think one of the most things, when I went back, when I realized that he realized that most of the people coming back to his town, it's been 27 plus years. So most of the people he grew up with are gone. They're always like this desolated place. Everybody's young. He's the old, the older one, right? And I think that's the realization that I'm coming to. That my grandmother's still here, but she just turned 86. And really having the conversation of like, really, this thing that we can't wait, right? And I think what politicians what ends up happening is like, oh, we'll wait. Something's gonna happen. And as undocumented people, we're always longing for for this thing to arrive that doesn't get here. Um, and I think with me, with my grandmother that now is here, and you know, uh, uh, since I'm not working at the assembly line no more, um, my mission now has become, and we should shift roles in which now I'm her provider, and I have to make sure that she lives as comfortable as possible, um, even though, you know, we, the things that we not have, she's going to have now. Um, and even now, she, you know, she's not used to it. I'm like, grandma, you want that? Let's buy it, girl. Let's put it on credit. Um, <laughs> We're not gonna be here long anyway, so we'll back these parts out. Um, <laughs> so I think uh, we're really doing that. And I'm gonna close with this piece. One of the things I realized in our house is that it was just like, you know, my grandma's a hoarder, she collects everything. Like, I'm like, and I think it's a poor people thing, right? They want like, oh, I'm gonna use this, I'm gonna use that. I'm like, girl, throw it away. I, mean, I know it's, I know I'm really bad for the climate, because I go to purchase a new one, you know? I'm on your big climate wall, but I'm like, no, girl, the basura, let's throw it out. Like, you haven't used it in three days, out. Um, so I decided to decorate, uh, repaint the house, and just throw the whole thing out, right? So I'm out here, like, then taking everything out, right? And she's having, have you seen orders? These people have meltdowns, right? So my girl is having a meltdown. She's like, you think my life is trash? I'm like, hi, down. So she has these ollas from Royal Prestige. Have <laughs> you heard of Royal Prestige? Yeah. These, old, these ollas are like 15 years old. Like, bro, like, this, they don't have that no more. So I was going to throw them away. But Royal Prestige is a scam because these ollas are worth like, what, $5,000? Oh, yeah, who, who buys my stuff? Grandma, you're not a chef. Um, so that's the only thing I couldn't get rid of. She still has them. She says she's going to leave them for us when we. <laughs> but it's gonna be an artifact. Um, so I wrote this piece. 
series uh, about my grandma, and I'll end with this. It goes like this. June 2019. Abuela is a hoarder. I guess that's what happens when you grow up poor. You collect things that's thinking sooner or later you're going to be needing them. I'm fresh out of watching Tidying Up with Mary Kondo, and I've taken it upon myself to be a maricon of my own. <laughs> Anyways, I've taken up the challenge to remodel my abuela's house. Ever since my abuelito passed, passed away, it hit me. The way so many of our parents paid, spent saving all their money with the idea of one day returning to Mexico and spending it all there. When my abuelo was alive, he would brag about how in Mexico, he's going to tour all the beaches. He's going to sit on the hammock, eat guayabas, mangos, and papaya. His eye would shine just dreaming of all this nostalgic land, even though the news reported Guerrero as being one of the most dangerous states in Mexico. The day my abuelo chose to self-deport, he wanted it to be known that this country did not kick him out. He wanted it to be known that he left on his own accord. You know when you're getting when you're drunk off your ass, getting kicked out the club and saying, fuck it, I didn't want to be here anyway. <laughs> <laughs> that day was sort of like a funeral. We gathered at my abuela's house. We packed three bands with all our relatives, and on the 280 North, we began our procession to watch my grandfather depart out of SFO. For most of us, this was the last time we saw him. For my grandmother, this was the, the last time she kissed him. Abuelo passed away two years ago, this February. We missed him. But truth be told, we lost him the day he self-deported. Now that mi abuela is out here living her single, modern Latina life, <laughs> and she is the last sacred thing I have, I have made it my journey to have her live her best life. I mean, simply because this country plays games with our spirits, does not mean that my undocumented abuela does not deserve to have the best. It's fascinating to me. The amount of suffering so many of our parents endure. It's like we all, we take all this pain, we honor it, and then we keep on moving. We carry these aches in our, to our grave. We exist in this country with the idea that if we suffer here in the United States, because one day we will rejoice in our homelands. It's almost like the U.S. is the hell we must endure before we make it to the promised land. Our future as a documented folk is uncertain, but I challenge us to not let this country turn us into monsters. I challenge us to honor and celebrate each other. I challenge us to see the beauty in our power. I don't like the word resilience. Resilience means that we are surviving under a natural force. But there is nothing natural about the way this country tries to swallow us, nothing natural about being haunted. I haven't word, found the words to describe how my tia still managed to get up for work every morning, the way my abuelita still manages to laugh until try, tears begin to fill her eyes. There must be a word to describe our undocumented joy. But until I find the word, let's just call it magic. <laughs> Um, 